shame is gone I stand amazed in your love undeniable your grace goes on and on and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name As your glory fills this place, you alone deserved our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens. As your glory fills this place, you alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Worthy is your name. your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name
stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire i'll rejoice cause you're there too i won't be formed by feelings i hold fast to what is true if the cross brings transformation then i'll be crucified with you cause that is just a doorway a resurrection life and if I join you in your suffering I'll join you when you rise and when you return in glory with the angels and the saints my heart will still be singing my song will be the same oh, Christ be magnified Verses 1 to 10. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and they consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses cried out to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of the place was Taberah, because of the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rebel that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also whipped again and said, Oh, that we had meat to it. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, that cucumbers, the lemons, the licks, the onions, and the garlics. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance like that of billion. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in a hand mill or beat it in a mortar and boiled it in a pot and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the Jew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna filled with it. Verse 10, Moses heard the people whipping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly and Moses was displaced, displeased. Numbers chapter 11, verses 18 to 20. And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have whipped in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat. Then, and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome of you, because you have rejected the Lord, who is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or what that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us in the land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. 
would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the, Lord, the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Verse 11, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit, and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater than mightier and mightier than they. Good morning, BTC students. It's a joy and a delight to be with you virtually here in this chapel uh, series where we're dealing with issues of how we use our mouth, being careful about what we say and even how we say it. I thank uh, Sir Bob for the invitation to join in and to share with you this morning. Uh, today, we're going to look at the issue of, or I've entitled my sermon, Stop Whining. And we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, in light of uh, Numbers 11 and Numbers 14. I want to thank the uh, students for the uh, music that was prepared for this chapel service and thank the uh, student reader who uh, read a rather long passage uh, for the chapel service today. I trust that the Lord will use this uh, to encourage us and to challenge us as we consider. Uh, this important topic about not grumbling or complaining. Let's pray together. Father, we would ask that you would indeed guide us, direct us. I pray that, Lord, you would speak to us and that, Lord, you would help us to apply the lessons that we've learned from the ancient text today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stop your whining. Quit your complaining. I'm sure none of you have ever heard your mother say those or similar words to you. But there are only a few things that are more irritating to a parent than incessant, non-stop whining from a child. It can drive a parent to distraction. Sometimes when I'm asked, how are you? I respond, well, I can't complain. Besides, no one wants to listen to me when I do. It's true. No one likes to listen to someone who constantly grumbles and complains. We have an expression that's a bit sarcastic, but we use it when, it when someone is fussing about something that's not really important. We ask, would you like a little cheese with your wine? Or we might give a not so subtle hint that we don't want to listen to someone's complaining. We don't speak whinies here. A few weeks ago, my family was gathered around the dining room table at my sister's house to play some games. I was having a difficult time and was falling behind. It seemed that I could not draw the right domino or someone else was playing in a spot where I could have played. I started to verbalize my annoyance. After about the third or the fourth complaint, my sister asked, Who's calling the ambulance?" 
Having grown up in a Christian home, my parents would often appeal to the authority of the Bible to get us to change our behavior. Sometimes they would ask us to memorize a verse to help us understand a biblical principle they wanted us to practice in the home. For instance, they had us memorize the famous passage about the characteristics of love from 1 Corinthians 13, so that we would be patient with and kind to one another and not easily angered. Another verse we heard quoted a lot when we were growing up was Philippians 2.14. Do everything without grumbling. Now, I think I think my parents were just wearied by my two little sisters' habit of complaining and whining, but I can't be sure. For a while, I think we used to have a verse, this verse inscribed on a homemade sign that was prominently displayed near the kitchen sink, since my sisters didn't like doing the dishes. But this instruction that Paul gives here is about more than just getting children to stop complaining about doing household chores. So what is the big deal about a little murmuring and complaining? Why does it warrant a prohibition from the apostle? I believe that grumbling and complaining are an insult to God. They are sinning against God in one of two ways when we complain. The passages from Numbers that we read earlier illustrates this. In Numbers 11, we see that the people of God sin against the Lord by having an attitude of ingratitude. In Numbers 14, we see that the people of God sin against the Lord by demonstrating a lack of faith in him. Let's review these two narratives more closely. Remember the context for these passages. The events in Numbers 11 occur just three days after the Israelites broke camp at Mount Sinai. The Israelites had been there for about a year after being miraculously delivered from 400 years of bondage in Egypt. They had received the Ten Commandments in direct, audible address from the Lord to the entire community. Moses then ascended the mountain to receive the tablets of stone that had been engraved with the finger of God himself with these sacred words. During the time on the mountain, Moses received the instructions for building a tabernacle that would be the physical manifestation of God's presence with his people. Once that structure was completed and dedicated, after Aaron and his sons were consecrated to be priests that would mediate between God and his people, the Lord instructed the Israelites to set out and make the 11-day journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. From there, they would invade the promised land and, uh, the, and take possession of the land that the Lord had promised to Abraham nearly 700 years earlier. I can only imagine the excitement of seeing this ancient promise fulfilled. The Israelites were living the dream. God's saving power had been demonstrated in unmistakable terms just a year ago in Egypt. The Lord provided for the entire community as they settled temporarily at Sinai, supplying enough food and water for the 600,000 men and their families in this desolate place. They were just eight days away from entering into their own permanent possession of Canaan. But what do we read in Numbers 11, 1? Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. The Bible tells us that the Lord was so angry with this expression of their ingratitude for all that he had done and was about to do that he sent the fire and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. The very next episode in Numbers 11 begins by recounting that the Israelites did not learn their lesson about being ungrateful. 
even though the Lord had provided for the daily necessities of this horde for more than a year. And even though they were literally days away from settling into their new homes in Canaan, where they, where they could enjoy the produce of the land, they wailed. If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The Israelites had only uh, escaped the brutality, had just only escaped the brutality and despair of Egypt due to God's gracious commitment to his promise made to Abraham. And that escape should have been fresh in their memories since only 13 months had elapsed. But now, all they could remember of Egypt is the fish and the, the delicious vegetables they used to eat at no cost. What were they thinking? Had the horrors of slavery, the cruel slaughter of the Hebrew ba boy babies by Pharaoh, and the centuries of mistreatment been permanently erased from their collective and individual memories? Their forgetfulness was a symptom of ingratitude. How much better to eat a little manna with freedom than to eat the choicest of foods, which they probably did not really get to enjoy anyway in Egypt, in slavery. This complaining was not isolated amongst a few Israelites. Numbers 11.10 tells us that people from every family were wailing at the entrance to their tent. It's no wonder that the Lord became exceedingly angry. This level of ingratitude is almost inconceivable, right? How could the Israelites forget so quickly? How could they not only refuse to acknowledge the Lord's spectacular mercies in delivering them from Egypt, but also reject his daily provisions of food in this barren wilderness? Now, if I were God, and it's a good thing I am not for many reasons, I would have made good on my earlier threat to wipe out the entire population and start over with Moses and make a great nation out of him. But even though the Lord was exceedingly angry, he decided to give them what they asked for. The Lord instructed Moses to tell the Israelites, Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when, when you will eat meat. What an amazing act of grace to give these whiners and complainers exactly what they asked for. Maybe it's not such a bad idea after all, right? Just keep complaining and grumbling until you get on God's nerves, just like little toddlers do with their parents, to manipulate them into yielding to their demand. But before you settle on that conclusion, read just a little further. In verses 18 to 20, Moses continues, now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day, or two days, or five, or ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils, and you loathe it, because you rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? Be careful what you ask for. You might just get what you want and a whole lot of it. The ingratitude of the Israelites was actually rooted in a rejection of the Lord himself. Grumbling and complaining are an insult to God. As we grumble and complain, we are sinning against God by revealing an attitude of ingratitude. Let's briefly review the next passage 
that was read earlier, Numbers 14. This event occurred within weeks of the previous account of the Israelites complaining about the manna. They are now encamped in the desert of Paran, on the south side of the border of the land of Canaan. Before Moses can devise his military strategy for conquering the inhabitants of Canaan, he needs to do some reconnaissance. So he appoints a single man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and instructs them to go throughout the land of Canaan to make a survey of the military obstacles and also provide a report of the bounty in this land. The spies did just that. For 40 days, they traveled the length and the breadth of the land, noting their observations. And they also cut a single cluster of grapes that was so large that two men had to carry it on a pole between them. They also bought, brought back pomegranates and figs. As they showed the people the luscious fruits of the land, they testified that the Lord's description of the land of promise was indeed true. The land to which you sent us indeed flows with, with milk and honey. Then they uttered that dreadful word. But this is usually not a good thing. Their glowing report pivots and becomes a horror story of epic proportion. In the conclusion of their report, there is not a chance that we could go in and take that land from the inhabitants. The people are giants. The cities have impregnable defenses and the land devours those living in it. We don't have a prayer. There's not a scenario in which we can overcome this people. We are all going to die. The news of that report spread like wildfire in the Israelite camp, and the Bible tells us that all that night, that that night the all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud imagine what that must have sounded like with millions of people crying out in despair furthermore the bible recounts all the israelites grumbled against moses and aaron and the whole assembly said to them if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? And our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Only 13 months earlier, the people have been standing on the shores of the Red Sea after being delivered by God's mighty hand. They sang and danced as they saw the bodies and the chariots of the Egyptians floating on the violent waves of the sea that came crashing down on their hated slave masters. They were finally free. God met with them at Mount Sinai and provided for them over the course of a year that they had been traveling. Now they were literally standing on the doorstep of their new home promised to their forefather Abraham 700 years earlier. And now they're casting doubt on the Lord's ability to make good on his commitment to give them the land of Canaan. And they did not believe that the Lord could destroy the inhabitants of Canaan and bring them safely into the land of promise. They were certain that the men would be slaughtered in battle and the women and children would, take, would be taken as plunder. They decided that their best alternative was to return to enslavement in Egypt. Can you imagine? In that crisis, Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes and cried out to the people, 
The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly had talked about stoning Joshua and Caleb until the glory of the Lord intervened. From the glory cloud, the Lord addressed Moses in the hearing of all Israel. How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? Did you hear that? When God's people refuse to believe him, they are treating him with contempt. In their disbelief, the Israelites decided to choose a different uh, leader who would take them safely back to Egypt. Remember what I said earlier. Be careful what you ask for. You might get, you might get it, and a whole lot of it. Now listen to the words the Lord of the Lord as he explains how he will give the grumblers exactly what they ask for. How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who is, counted, who is counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be shepherd there, shepherds there for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, for one year, for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness, and here they will die. God takes grumbling and complaining very seriously because these behaviors reveal either an underlying attitude of ingratitude or a refusal to trust in him. So when the Apostle Paul admonishes the Philippians to do everything without complaining or grumbling, it's, it is pretty important to pay attention and stop your whining. The Lord does not speak in whinies. I know that you have all had a stressful year and a half with COVID and the attending restrictions. I know that many of you have faced incredible hardships. I'm guessing that not a few of you have had struggles in your families, in your churches, in your personal lives, in your relationships and maybe even in your studies. You might even be tempted to grumble and complain, but be careful what you ask for. Rather, focus on how much you have, you have and verbalize to God your words of thanksgiving for all that he has so wondrously provided. 
Reflect on the evidences of God's faithfulness to you. Recall all that his mercies have been made new every morning and put away that attitude of ingratitude. Maybe you are facing insurmountable obstacles or impossible situations. Maybe you're looking out into the promised land of God's calling and all you can see are giants in the land. You're tempted to give up hope and cry out, it's no use. I could never enjoy the promises of God and take possession of the inheritance that he has offered to me. Be careful about grumbling and complaining to God in those circumstances. Do not put God in a place where he's asking the question, how long will my children, child uh, treat me with contempt? How long will she or he refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed? Your unbelief in God's ability to keep his promises to you could keep you from entering into his rest and enjoying the fruits that are waiting for you in the land. Let me close with this word, with these words of exhortation from the prophet Isaiah. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even you grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those whose hope those who hope in the lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not faint stop your whining Let's pray. Our Father, we would ask that you would indeed teach us. Father, as we have received the word, I pray that we would do so gladly. For those of us who have received a rebuke, I pray that, Lord, we would seek your forgiveness for our grumbling and complaining. And Father, we would recognize in our own hearts an attitude of ingratitude that is contemptuous of you or that father we would see something even darker a disbelief in your goodness and a disbelief in your ability to follow through on your promises to us Father, I pray that you would guard the hearts and lives of each of the students. And I pray the Lord, as they reflect on this truth, as they reflect on the narratives of the historical account of your interaction with your people, Israel, that, Father, they would learn from this negative example. And that, Lord, they would reject the thoughts and the temptations to complain and grumble. And that, Lord, rather they would recognize all that they have and give you thanks. That they would recognize the testimony of your faithfulness in the past and have great confidence in the future that you will indeed bring them through. Father, we would ask that you would be pleased as we apply these principles to our hearts and our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.